Well, it's a real privilege to be with you here in Edmond, Oklahoma, to study this very important subject on the meaning of the seven churches of the book of Revelation. We want to begin in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where we have the introduction to the book. And uh, there are several things in uh, Revelation 1, 1 and 2 that I want to underline that we're going to take a closer look at in our study today. First of all, I want to read those verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about the word revelation. Which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it. That's another word we're going to take a look at. Signified it by his angel to his servant John. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Now the first thing that I want us to notice is that in Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 we have a chain of command, a way in which God communicates his will to human beings. The process there is found in these verses and we also need to look at a certain phrase uh, that is found in each of the seven churches. How does the process work? Well, God gives a message to Jesus. So it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. So God the Father gives a message to Jesus. Jesus then gives the message to the Holy Spirit. You say, well, the Holy Spirit isn't here in verses 1 and 2. Yes, but he is found in the seven churches where it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the Spirit is involved as well. So you have God the Father giving the message to Jesus. Jesus then gives the message to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then gives the message to the angel. The angel in turn gives the message to John. Then John writes the message in a book and sends the book to the seven churches. That is the book of Revelation. And then God expects the church to proclaim the message that is found in the book to the world. And so there is a definite chain of command in which God operates the universe and also communicates his will to human beings. Once again, let's read verses 1 and 2 so that we can catch this nuance. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. And then a little bit later on, we're going to find in verses 9 through 11, it says, John to the seven churches. And then of course, the seven churches we're going to see are to proclaim this message to the world. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to take a look at uh, several phrases in the beginning of the book of Revelation we're going to look at what the word revelation means. We're going to also look at what the servants of God uh, refers to. We're going to take a look at the word signified, also the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I would like to mention that uh, the angels are far more important than what we realize in the way in which God communicates his will to human beings. And uh, I would like us to take a look at this fact because many people just simply think that, you know, God speaks his message to the prophet personally. But really, we're going to find that there is a chain of command, as we've already noticed. Incidentally, um, the Bible tells us that uh, the message is given by the Spirit to the angel, and then the angel gives the message to John. This is interesting because with Ellen White, the same process was followed. Jesus, uh, Ellen White referred to the angel as uh, my angel or as my guide. We believe that her writings were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yet, the Holy Spirit used the angel to give the message to um, Ellen White. So the same thing that happened with John happened also with Ellen White. Now I want us to take a look at several uh, quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy 
on the tremendous importance of angels in God committing His will to man. I want to read first of all from Desire of Ages, page 352. God's people are to contend with supernatural forces. Of course, that's the devil and his angels. But they are assured of supernatural help. All the intelligences of heaven are in this army. And more than angels are in the ranks. So you notice that the intelligences of, intelligences of heaven are the army of the Lord and the army are the angels. So it says uh, here, And more than angels are in the ranks. The Holy Spirit, now listen carefully, the representative of the captain of the Lord's host. How many persons do we find there? Three. Notice once again, the Holy Spirit, who is the representative of the captain of the Lord's host. So the Lord is God the Father, the captain is Jesus. And of course, the representative of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Three persons involved in imparting the message. Now, I want to read also Desire of Ages, page 143. The angels of God are ever passing from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. And now comes a surprising statement. The miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of the angels. How were the miracles of Christ performed? Interesting. By the power of God through the ministration of the angels. And then we find the quotation ending by saying, and it is through Christ, by the ministration of His heavenly messengers, that every blessing comes from God to us. Amen. The angels are the link between God and humans. The Ministry of Healing, page 417, also gives an explanation about the role of angels in the way in which God imparts His message and runs the universe. Ministry of Healing, page 417. The Bible shows us God in His high and holy place. How do we pray? How did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father which art everywhere? Amen. No. Our Father which art in heaven. The Father is in heaven. Heaven is a place. The Father is in a place. So how does He communicate with us? Listen. The Bible shows us God in His high and holy place, not in a state of inactivity, not in silence and solitude, but surrounded by 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of holy beings, all waiting to do His will. Now listen carefully. Through these messengers, He... That is whom? The one who is in the high and holy place. Through these messengers, he is in active communication with every part of his dominion. Amen. How is God, uh, according to this, in active communication with every part of his dominion? Through the angel messengers. Once again, we finish the statement. By his spirit, he is everywhere present. Through the agency of His Spirit and His angels, He ministers to the children of men. You know, when we think about the day of Pentecost, many times we think, well, the day of Pentecost, you know, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was uh, just basically, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit gave people the gift of tongues so that they could speak different languages. But, you know, the first time that the gift of tongues was given was at the Tower of Babel. Right? Yes. The people at the Tower of Babel were given the capacity to speak it, the language that we speak in the world today, the different languages. Now, if you read Story of Redemption, you'll find that it tells us that 
those who, uh, the, the ones who confused those who were building the tower and actually gave them the languages were two angels that God sent from heaven. In other words, the angels inserted, so to speak, a Rosetta Stone into the brain of those people there so that they could speak the languages of the nations. So the question is, on the day of Pentecost, was the Holy Spirit involved through the ministry of the angels? I want to read you a series of very interesting statements. In the devotional book, My Life Today, page 58, we find these words. When the truth in its simplicity is lived in every place, then God will work through His angels as He worked on the day of Pentecost. God will work through whom? Through His angels as He worked on the day of Pentecost. And what is the result? And hearts will be changed so decidedly that there will be a manifestation of the influence of genuine truth as is represented by the descent of the Holy Spirit. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 57. When the angels of heaven come among us and work through human agents, there will be solid, substantial conversions after the order of the conversions after the day of Pentecost. Notice once again, the angels were involved in Pentecost. So it says, when the angels of heaven come among us, and work through human agents, that's us, there will be solid, substantial conversions after the order of the conversions after the day of Pentecost. Maybe I can read just one or two more. Heavenly intelligences, this is Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, page 284. Heavenly intelligences are looking on. And when imbued with zeal for Christ's honor, we place ourselves in the channel of God's providence, these heavenly messengers, that is the angels, will impart to us a new spiritual power so that we shall be able to combat difficulties and triumph over obstacles. Wow. One more. This is the most remarkable of all. It's in the devotional book that I may know him, page 118. Through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the mind and heart of the human agent and draw him to Christ. Amen. Wow, what a statement. Through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the mind and heart of the human agent and draw him to Christ. However, the Spirit of God does not interfere with the freedom of a human agent. The Holy Spirit is given to be a helper so that man may cooperate with the divine and it is given to him to draw the soul but never to force obedience. Amen. And so at the beginning of the book of Revelation we find very clearly that the angels are actually the link between God and us. God the Father who is in the high and holy place gives the message to Jesus. Jesus gives the message to the Spirit. The Spirit then gives it to the angel, and the angel imparts it to John. John then gives it to the church, and the church is supposed to give it to the world. That is God's chain of command. That's the way in which God operates the universe. Incidentally, for those who are Adventists, do we believe that God inspired the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy? Yes. Do we believe that God inspired Ellen White as she wrote? Yes. Absolutely yes. But let me ask you, who gave Ellen White the information? We say that she was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but Ellen White repeatedly said that next to her side stood an angel. She called him my guide. She called him my angel, giving Ellen White the information. So it's not any different from Ellen White as it was with John. It's God through Jesus and the Spirit giving to the angel the information to give to us. Amen. Now let's say a few things about the seven churches of Revelation. There were many churches in Asia Minor at the end of the first century. The book of Revelation was written around the year 96 AD according to 
uh, the theologians, according to the experts. Now, there were many churches in Asia Minor at this time, such as Troas, Asos, Miletus, Colossae, Hierapolis, Magnesia, and other churches in Asia Minor. So the question is, why did God choose these specific seven churches out of all of the churches that there were in Asia Minor? I believe that there are two reasons. The first reason is, and uh, you know for those who actually get this series after we've produced it, there's going to be a graphic where you'll see that the churches are geographically set up in Asia Minor in the form of a candelabrum. Interesting, because Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus is walking in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And so if, if you think of the uh, candelabrum being set up on Patmos and the sun shining on the candelabrum, the shadow in Asia Minor would be in the exact order as the seven churches in the book of Revelation. So that's one reason, the geography. The second reason is that the characteristics of these seven churches actually illustrated the condition of the church in seven periods of church history till the end of time. In fact, I would like to read a couple of statements. The first one is from the book Acts of the Apostles, page 585, where we find some very interesting details about these seven churches, which, by the way, they were literal seven churches. They were really seven churches in Asia Minor that formed uh, the shape of a candelabrum and actually illustrated conditions that would exist in the church from apostolic times till the end of time. In Acts of the Apostles, page 585, we find these words. The names of the seven churches are symbolic. Notice the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. So the names are what? Symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness. In other words, the number seven indicates that this is the complete history of the church and is symbolic of the fact that these messages extend to the end of time. While the symbols used, because in the churches there's lots of symbols, the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. Are you understanding what she's saying? Now she's not the only one. Many evangelical scholars also believe, non-Adventist scholars believe that the seven churches actually illustrate seven periods of church history from apostolic times till the end of time. I want to read you just one as an example. Hal Lindsey. You say, wow, you're choosing Hal Lindsey, the futurist? Yes, because on this particular point he's right. We disagree with him almost on 99% of what he says. But on this one point, he's right. And he agrees with what was written by Ellen White. I read from his book, Vanished into Thin Air, page 276. I believe, along with many scholars, that these seven letters were not only written to seven literal churches with real problems, but also that they have a prophetic application to church history. I believe that these seven churches were selected and arranged by our omniscient Lord because they had problems and characteristics that would prophesy seven stages of history through which the church universal would pass. So very interesting, and he's only one of many non-Adventist scholars who have concluded that the seven churches actually represent the totality of the history of the church, denoted by the number seven. The symbols show the condition of the church at different periods of time, and the names of the churches give the characteristic of the period in which that church existed. Now, when we study the book of Revelation, we need to keep in mind that the method we should use is what I call the historical flow method. The book of Revelation has things that took place in the past. Some of the things in Revelation are occurring in the present. 
And there are some things that have not begun to be fulfilled yet. And as historicists, as individuals who use the historical flow method, we should not take the things from the past and apply them to the future, or take the things from the future and apply them to the past. The book of Revelation has a chain of chronological events, and we must determine when each period is being spoken of. By the way, this is uh, illustrated at the very beginning of the book. Notice Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. Write these thing, the things which you have seen. What time is that? Past. And the things which are. That's when John was living. And what else? And the things which will take place after this. So there's a past dimension of prophecy, there's a present dimension of prophecy, and there's a future dimension of prophecy. That's the historical flow method. Let's read also verses 4 through 7 of Revelation chapter 1. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace, and peace from him who, notice, is, that's the present, who what? Was, that's the past, and who is to come. So history flows past, present, future. God is a God of the past, the present, and the future. He's the Alpha and the Omega. So notice what it continues saying. Once again, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the rulers over the king of the earth. Now notice the tenses here. To him who loved us, what tense is that verb? Past, and what else? And washed us, is the crucifixion past at this point? Yes. yes. And washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us past, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So you have here the past event. He loved us and he washed us and he has made us kings and priests. But that's the past reference point where the book of Revelation begins. But Revelation chapter 1 also gives us the ending point in the historical flow. Notice verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds. When, he, when does that event take place? In the future, he is coming with clouds. And every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So when we study the book of Revelation, we need to be very careful that we recognize which events have already taken place, which events are presently occurring, like the healing of the deadly wound, it's well on its way, and the events that have not yet transpired. Because if we translocate the information, we're going to be all confused. I want to read from Acts of the Apostles, page 584. Ellen White concurs with what we just read from the book of Revelation. Some of the scenes depicted in this prophecy, that is the prophecy of the book of Revelation, are in the past. Some are what? Now taking place. Some bring to view what? The close of the great conflict between the powers of darkness and the prince of heaven. And some even go further. Some reveal the triumphs and joys of the redeemed in the earth made new. Do you see the, the four periods that are mentioned there? Some are past, some are taking place, some uh, describe the conflict that God's people will go through in the end time, and the last stage reveals the triumphs and joys of the redeemed in the earth made new. Amen. But the book of Revelation follows a certain sequence, the historical flow method. It is in chronological order. In other words, that we have to look at the churches, the seals, and the trumpets. You see, Revelation also runs in repetitive cycles. But you have this phenomenon that there's a chain of events. And you can't take a future event and put it in the past, or a past event and place it in the future. 
I would like to also read another statement where the spirit of prophecy warns us about taking things that apply that have already taken place and applying them to the future. And by the way, there are some Seventh-day Adventists that are doing this right now. They are saying that the trumpets have a second application. Yeah, they were fulfilled in the past, you know, but they're going to be fulfilled again in the future. And they're saying Daniel 11, you know, the Adventist church used to believe that the king of the south was, uh, was atheism as it appeared in France at the French Revolution. But now they're saying, you know, now we have new light. It's Islam that is represented by the king of the south. And then there's various interpretations on Revelation chapter 17 as well. Here is the warning of the spirit of prophecy. Some will take the truth applicable to their time and place it in the future. Events in the train of prophecy, notice train, events in the train of prophecy that had their fulfillment in the past are made future. And thus by these theories, the faith of some is undermined. So it's very important to study the structure of the book of Revelation, the order of events in the book of Revelation. Now we need to ask the question, where was John when he received the book of Revelation, and why was he there? Let's go to Revelation chapter 1 and verses 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Here he says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called what? Patmos, that's the where. Now why was he there? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's because of the witness that he gave. Because of the word of God that he was there. Now, so that answered the question, where was he and why was he there? Because when he bore witness, he was sent there. Now the question is, when was the vision of the book of Revelation given to him? Well, verse 10 explains. I was in the spirit, that means he was in vision, on the Lord's day. So when was uh, the book of Revelation given? Seven. On the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Cyrus, uh, Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now let's say a few things about Patmos, where John was. Patmos is a little island uh, on the Aegean Sea, about 50 miles southwest of Ephesus. Uh, the island covers an area of 16 square miles. It has no trees and it has no rivers. In fact, Patmos was the Alcatraz of the Roman Empire. The worst criminals were sent there into exile. So the question is, how did John, who was not a criminal, end up there? Well, according to Ellen White, uh, during the period of the Emperor Domitian, who ruled from the year 81 to the year 96 AD, he threw John into a cauldron of boiling oil in the hopes of frying John alive. But God preserved him, as he did the three young men who were thrown into the fiery furnace. In Acts of the Apostles, page 570, we find these words. John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. God had a plan for John. Amen. He needed to end up at Thotmos to give us this majestic book of Revelation. By the way, what Ellen White states is not something new. Uh, there is an ancient Christian tradition that agrees with Ellen White's statement. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, wrote this about John. John was plunged into a burning pot of hot oil without being hurt, and then was banished to an island. So uh, we know that they tried to kill him, and because the emperor was not able to fry him to death, he said, well, let's exile him to where the criminals are. Incidentally, Clement of Alexandria, also one of the church fathers, added that during the ruler, rulership 
of the emperor Nerva, John was released from Patmos and he returned to Ephesus where he became a bishop of the church. Very interesting. Now we noticed that this vision was given to John when? On the Sabbath day. Now some of our ablest scholars, even in the Adventist church, have argued that the Lord's day that is mentioned here really means the same as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is coming as a burning oven. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 others. John, when he was on Patmos, he was transported to the times of the second coming of Christ. The fact is that that does not square with what the spirit of prophecy tells us. The spirit of prophecy is explicit about when John was given this vision. He was not transferred to the day of the Lord at the second coming. He actually received this vision on the Sabbath. Interesting that the final controversy will be over the day of worship, over the Sabbath. Why do we not agree with this conclusion of some of our scholars? First of all, it doesn't fit with the context, context of Revelation 1. The context of Revelation 1 is that Jesus is in the holy place of the sanctuary. We're going to study that. And secondly, it does not agree with what we find in the spirit of prophecy. I want to read from Acts of the Apostles 581 and 582. It was on the Sabbath that the Lord of glory appeared to the exiled apostle. The Sabbath was as sacredly observed by John on Patmos as when he was preaching to the people in the towns and cities of Judea. He claimed as his own the precious promises that had been given regarding that day. And then Ellen White quotes Revelation 1 verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, John writes, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So when did John receive this specific vision? He received it on a Sabbath day. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now how do we know that the Lord's day refers to the Sabbath? Well, because Jesus said the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And the Bible says, you shall keep the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now if the Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, then the Sabbath is the Lord's day. So we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Now let's take a look at some of the details that we find at the beginning of the book of Revelation. More specifically, the introduction to the book. First of all, the beginning of verse 1 indicates that this book is not about monsters, mysterious numbers, and mystical symbols. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And by the way, Martin Luther never wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. Don't be too hard on him, because Martin Luther did not live in the times of the fulfillment of what we find in the book of Revelation. But he never wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. He didn't, also, he didn't write a commentary either on the book of James. He said, I don't find Christ in the book of Revelation. All I find is monsters and beasts and mysterious numbers. But the book itself tells us that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's say something about the book Revelation. The book Revelation is, uh, the name of the book Revelation actually is the Greek word apocalypse the apocalypse or the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. What does the apocalypse mean in the Greek language? It means to reveal or to unveil. So in other words, the revelation of Jesus Christ is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Incidentally, the word apocalypsis, which means to reveal, is the opposite of the word apocrypha, apocryphon which means to conceal. So the book of Revelation is not part of the Apocryphon, it's not concealed, it is part of the Apocalypsis, which means that it is a book revealed. The book of Revelation is not a sealed book. Amen. Now, there are two types of excuses that people give to not study the book of Revelation. You say, what are those excuses? Number one, they say the book of Revelation is a sealed book 
no one can understand it. And others say, I don't have enough education in order to understand it. I'm not literate enough. Notice Isaiah 29 verses 11 and 12, where we find these two excuses. Isaiah 29 verse 11 and verse 12. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is, illiter who is literate, saying, read this please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, read this please. And he says, I am not literate. <laughs> so the uneducated say, I don't have enough intelligence to uh, explain what the book means. And those individuals who are super intelligent, they say the book is sealed, so we can't understand it. Now there was one book that was sealed. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 tells us which book that was, and until when it would be sealed. It says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, that is the book of Daniel, until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So was the book of Daniel sealed in the days of Daniel? Yes. yes. What is, was it to remain sealed forever? No. no. At the time of the end, it was going to become unsealed. Actually, the book of Revelation is the unsealing of the book of Daniel. The book of Revelation is the complement to Daniel. It is the amplification, the explanation of Daniel, the unveiling of Daniel's message, the expansion, if you please. I want to read you a statement that we find in the book Acts of the Apostles 584 and 585. This revelation, speaking about the book, was given for the guidance and comfort of the church throughout the Christian dispensation. Yet, religious teachers have declared that it is a sealed book and its secrets cannot be explained. Who are the ones that say that? Religious teachers. Not the ignorant, but religious teachers that say, can't be explained, it's sealed. Therefore, many have turned from the prophetic record, refusing to devote time and study to its mysteries. However, God does not wish His people to regard the book thus. Amen. In the Revelation are portrayed the deep things of God. The very name given to its inspired pages, the Revelation, contradicts the statement that this is a sealed book. A revelation is something revealed. The Lord Himself revealed to His servant the mysteries contained in this book, and He designs that they shall be open to the study of all. Its truths are addressed to those living in the last days of this earth's history, as well as to those living in the days of John. So it's not only for us, it's also for the people who lived in the days of John. She continues, Let none think that because they cannot explain the meaning of every symbol in the Revelation, that it is useless for them to search this book in an effort to know the meaning of, and the truth it contains. Amen. The one who, who revealed these mysteries to John will give to what kind of searcher? The diligent searcher for truth, a foretaste of heavenly things. Amen. Those whose hearts are what? Open to the reception of truth will be enabled to understand its teachings and will be granted the blessing promised to those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet an end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the Revelation. But that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. The angel commanded, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Now God gave, in the introduction to the book, four reasons why we can understand this book. It doesn't mean that it's like reading the Reader's Digest or Time Magazine. It requires a lot of gray matter. It requires study and prayer, intense study and prayer. In the introduction, we have four reasons why this book can be understood. Number one, the name of the book. It's called the Revelation. 
of Jesus Christ. So if it's a revelation, it can be understood. Secondly, God pronounces a blessing on those who read, hear, and obey the writings in the book. How could God say, I'm going to give a blessing to those who read, hear, and obey, if you can't really understand the book? That would be kind of frustrating. Number three, John was explicitly told not to seal the book in chapter 22. God said, don't seal the words of the prophecy of this book. So the book is not sealed by the testimony of the book itself. And finally, in the messages to the seven churches, we find an interesting formula. It says there, he who hears, let him pay attention to the things that the Spirit reveals to the churches. Now, if we can't understand the book of Revelation, we would never be able to understand what the Spirit reveals to the churches. So we know that the book of Revelation is not a sealed book. It is an open book. Now, to whom was the book of Revelation addressed? Was it addressed to the world in general? No. You'll notice that chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2 tells us that this message was given to God's servants. It was not given to the world at large. It was given to God's servants, God's own chosen people. Of course, it goes without saying that once God's people assimilate the message, they are supposed to do what? They are supposed to proclaim the message. You study the book, you understand the message, you assimilate it, you eat it, so to speak, and then you proclaim it. You know, there's an interesting passage that we find in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4 that I want to read now. Moreover, he said to me, this is speaking about the book of Ezekiel, but the principle is the same. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll. How many of you have ever eaten a scroll before? I'm sure you would get indigestion. But this is talking when it says, eat the scroll, which is the way that they wrote books back in biblical times, it's meaning what? It means to study it, assimilate it, eat it. You know, I ate up that book. It was so good. Well, it says, eat this scroll, and now notice what it says, and go speak to the house of Israel. Eat it and speak it. Verse 2. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly, and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. Then he said to me, notice he eats it, it's nice and sweet. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of, house of Israel and speak with my words to them. And so very clearly, we are supposed to assimilate the message. We're supposed to masticate the message. Once we have assimilated it, we are to pro proclaim it to others. Now, another interesting detail in the introduction to the book is the fact that it speaks in symbolic language. This is indicated by the word signified. God signified the book. The first part of the word signified is sign. In other words, the book of Revelation is written in sign language. It's coded language. It's something that appeals to the ears and to the eyes. It's actually a drama. It's like living cartoons, if you please. It appeals to the senses. It's full of symbols, and the symbols must be decoded. Once again, it appeals to the eyes and to the ears, not only to the intellect. Let me give you some statistics. 35 times in the book, John says, I saw. Seven times he says, I beheld. Five times he uses the expression, I looked. Two times he used the expression, he showed me. Two times he used the expression, there appeared. 28 times he uses the expression, I heard. Eight times he said, I beheld. And four times he was given the command, Come and see. So the book of Revelation is a book that appeals not only to our intellect, it appeals to our eyes and to our ears. It's a living drama that has symbols that we must decode 
by looking at other places in Scripture. Now before we bring this to a close, we need to do two more things. First of all, I want to give you an overview of the seven churches. Because the seven churches, as we've already noticed, represent seven periods of church history from apostolic times till the end of time. The first church is Ephesus. The name means desirable. Interesting. Would everybody want to desire would everyone desire to be a member of the early church? I would think so. That would be a church that I certainly would desire to belong to. So Ephesus means desirable. Remember Ellen White said the names indicate the character of the church. Now what is the date for the church of Ephesus? Speaking now in terms of, of uh, the history of the Christian church. The date will be from the year 31 AD when Jesus was crucified and when Jesus resurrected and ascended to heaven and the year 100 at the end of the first century. What was the character of the church during this period? Well, first of all, it was desirable. It was a privilege to belong to this church. However, we are told that the church of Ephesus at the end of this period was already losing its first love. It was losing its zeal. And if you look at early church history, you're going to find that this is the case. The second church is the church of Smyrna. There's a lot of death language we're going to find when we study specifically the church of Smyrna. What does the word Smyrna mean? It means bittersweet myrrh. Now myrrh isn't something that we use very frequently, but in the Roman Empire, myrrh was used to embalm the dead. Now the question is, why would the church of Smyrna be called that, by that name, bittersweet myrrh? Simply because this represents the period of the persecutions of the Roman emperors against the Christian church. They were mowed down right and left. Tertullian said, the more they mow us down, the more we are. The blood of Christians is seed. And so there's a lot of death language that is used with reference to the church of Smyrna. It's a period where the church is suffering persecution and martyrdom at the hand of the Roman emperors. That's why she's called the Myrrh Church or the Church of Smyrna. And then we have the church of Pergamum. The word Pergamum means Acropolis or elevation. You see, the church of Pergamum was at a, in a very high elevation. Now, why would the church of Pergamum be called by that name, elevation? Well, we need to know which period this church applies to. It is the period from 313 through the year 538. Do you have any idea what period that was? You see, the church had been in the valley of persecution. And now the church is favored. And so from the, the doldrums of the pit, the church now enjoys popularity and prosperity given to it by the emperor Constantine. By the way, there are two persons mentioned in connection with the church of Pergamum. One is Balaam. Very interesting, Balaam. We're going to take a look at why the name of Balaam appears in connection with the church of Pergamum. And the other comes from Nicholas, the Nicolaitans. That is another very important name that we're going to study in the future. But the main point here is that when the church was in the valley, in the depths of persecution and martyrdom, now suddenly the church is favored by Constantine and the church is at the heights. That's the reason why this church is called Acropolis or Elevation. Then you have the fourth church, the church of Thyatira. The name Thyatira means sacrifice of penitence. You know, it's interesting, during this period, which by the way is from 538 to 1517, when the Protestant Reformation begins, during this period, the book of Daniel tells us that the uh, papacy removed 
the continual ministration of Jesus Christ. Perhaps that's the reason why it's called sacrifice of penance. You see, this period is a period of papal rule. And you say, how do we know this? Because there's an individual that is mentioned in connection with this church. Jezebel, the harlot, is mentioned in connection with the fourth church, Thyatira. Let me ask you, what does a woman represent in prophecy? A woman represents the church. What does a harlot woman represent? A harlot woman represents an apostate church. So let me ask you, would Thyatira represent the period of the apostate church, the harlot of Revelation chapter 17, who sits on many waters, dominates the nations, who uh, is clothed in purple and scarlet, has daughters that were born from her, fornicates with the kings of the earth, unites church and state, etc.? Absolutely. And so this is the period of papal oppression before the Protestant Reformation from 538 to 1517. Then you have the church of Sardis. The church of Thar Sardis is number five. What does the word Sardis mean? It means escaping. You say, now that's a funny name for a church, escaping from what? Well, the church of Sardis is the church of the Protestant Reformation. Did the Protestant Reformation begin to escape from the straitjacket of the papacy? It most certainly did. It began to escape from the darkness of papal rule. But did it fully escape from papal rule? No. In fact, we're going to notice that one of its characteristics is that it looked like it was alive, but it was really at the point of dying because it did not grow, it did not progress. And then you have the Church of Philadelphia. What does the word Philadelphia mean? It means brotherly love. That is the church that announced the hour of God's judgment between 1833 and 1844. The great second advent movement at the beginning or at the middle of the 19th century. They're known as the Millerites, but there were many others from many churches that joined this movement and proclaimed the soon coming of Jesus Christ. That was a church that we will find where there was a lot of love among the brethren. And then you have the church of Laodicea. The name Laodicea means judgment of the people. It's the church of the judgment. When God's people, those who profess the name of Jesus Christ, are actually judged. And the church of Laodicea covers from 1844 till the close of probation. Did you hear what I said? It covers, it doesn't go to the second coming. The church of Laodicea goes from the moment the probation closes to the time when the door of probation closes. You say, now what do you mean by that? This is the period when God judges those who have claimed the name of Jesus, not everyone, not the wicked, they're judged during the thousand years and after the thousand years. This judgment is of those, all of those who at some point have claimed the name of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But let me ask you, are there many in the church that are lukewarm? So does a separation need to be made? Absolutely. When Jesus comes again, he is not coming to take Laodicea to heaven. You say, now what do you mean? He's not going to take Laodicea to heaven? No, he's not going to take Laodicea to heaven. You see, the message to the church of Laodicea comes to a lukewarm people. And when that message comes, people are going to decide whether to become hot or whether to become cold. That is called in the writings of Ellen White, the shaking. Jesus says, you get hot or I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. So when Jesus comes, there's not going to be a Laodicean church. There's not going to be a lukewarm church. This message will polarize everyone at the end of time who claims Christ. People will become hot or they will become cold. On the one hand, some people in Laodicea will become hot. And they will join the Philadelphian church. I'm going to show you that the church of Philadelphia was fulfilled partially in, eight, in the 1830s and 1840s 
but its full fulfillment is at the end. The Laodiceans will become Philadelphians. And those individuals who become hot and join the church of Philadelphia, not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, mind you, will receive God's seal. On the other hand, those individuals who reject the message to the Laodiceans will no longer be lukewarm, they will turn cold. They will join the synagogue of Satan, which another name is Babylon, and they will receive the mark of the beast. So there's no Laodicea when Jesus comes, no lukewarm church. Everyone will become hot or cold. Jesus will not come to take Laodicea to heaven. Let me read you this statement, early writings, page 270. Ellen White is speaking about the shaking. The spewing out of the mouth is the shaking, folks. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. What causes the shaking? People either become hot or cold. The testimony to the Laodiceans. This will have its effects upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. Those are the ones who become cold. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. And when probation closes, everyone will be either hot or cold. Are you with me? Now, in ending, we want to summarize in the very a short time that we still have, that each message to the church has seven parts. First, the address to the church pastor. It says, and to the angel in the church of Ephesus, right, and so on. Second, a description of Jesus is given to each church that fits the condition of the church. Three, there's a commendation. Jesus praises the church. By the way, the only church he doesn't praise is the church of Laodicea. Then he gives the censure and the rebuke, the things that need to be corrected in the church. Then, number five, he gives an exhortation about what the church should really do. And then, number six, he appeals to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then, number seven, there are the promises to the overcomers. And by the way, Laodicea is the only church of which Jesus says nothing good and the Church of Philadelphia is the only church of which he says nothing bad. We will study all of these things as we go along in our study here.